can get started and people will join us on a rolling basis, if that's all right. Um, I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for making time and overcoming the Zoom fatigue um, to Johannes and Ava for staying and Paula for staying up late to do this with us, even though it looks like beautiful daylight still in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Valerie Katawala and I'm a writer based in New York, focused on wines of Germany, Austria, and Altaranje. Um, my name is Paula Sidor, and I am an, also an American wine writer, but I'm based over here in Germany. Um, I've been here since 2002. Um, I came over, just a, a short background, I came over from Virginia, um, where I was before, thinking petrol was thinking something that I put in my car. And my very first German wine class uh, was in a class full in, of people in Koblenz, which for anyone who knows Germany is full of winemakers, sons and daughters. Um, so I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, let's sort of call it trial by, uh, trial by Riesling instead of trial by fire. Hopefully, I've learned a bit since then, it's been a little while, including a bit of German. And one of the things that I learned in German is the German word for drink, which is the thing that you see in the background. It's called Trink. Um, in addition to being a word, Trink is also a brand new publication that Valerie and I have launched because we spent a lot of time talking about German wine, about German speaking wine, and realizing that the two sides of the ocean didn't really seem to be talking to each other. The things that were available over here were sometimes available over in the States, but people didn't seem to understand exactly what it was or why it was. It was the, the classic lost in translation. And so being the kind of people that we are, we said, let's do something about it. <laughs> and so we launched Trink and the website goes live with the one pager in these Trink talks um, today and uh, we'll be having up writing coming in from all sorts of different places on both sides of the ocean, all sorts of crazy new voices um, sometime later this summer. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, we've started this series because we figured that the, one of the things that we kept hearing were all of these reasons why German wine or German speaking wine was going to be difficult to convince people to buy. Um, they said German wine is, all white German wine is all Riesling German wine gives me heartburn. Um, and, uh, and so we said, okay, well, the best way to deal with that is to tackle it head on. So we launched this series of Trink Talks. Um, and the first ones are six myths, six myths about German wine. And the biggest myth about German wine is, if I were in a room, I would ask everybody to say it, but I can't, so <laughs> uh, all German wine is sweet which as we all know is not the case. Sugar plays a role, it plays an important role, but sugar isn't necessarily sweet. So that's why we decided to start today with two fantastic guests from two of the classic um, wine, wine producing regions in Germany and two that are perhaps known for being sweeter regions. Um, Rheingau is the birthplace of the Schwedleser and Mosul is certainly what everybody thinks about. I, I'm shorthanding Mosul, I know it's the Tsar. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't want to offend anybody starting up. Oh. <laughs> so, for your introductions, I will turn it over um, to you, Eva, and then to you, Johannes, to talk a little bit about um, about you guys, about your estates, and then we'll move on to a couple of questions. And Paula, thank you so much for that. If I can just jump in with a few words on procedure. You mentioned it for the people who came in early, but just for those who are joining us now, um, we've muted all audience members, but we really encourage you to chime in with any of your questions or comments in the chat, and we will try to get through as many of them as we can at the end of the conversation. Um, and just to know that this is being recorded, uh, we will have it available on our website. So if you have a questions and want to refer back to it or want to share it with anybody, all of the conversations in this series will be available there. So now, uh, shall we start with you, Ava? A quick, quick intro? Um, just need to unmute. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, hello everybody. It's um, thank you for the invitation. It's a it's um, a great chance and and super interesting topic. It's actually um, one of the biggest myths that we always um, happen to be asked. I think Johannes uh, will agree on that. It's the the classical thing with Riesling that sugar shows in a different way. Um, and uh, maybe just to, to to start a little bit of about the domain. Um, I'm not from a wine family. Um, I'm from Northern Germany. I don't come from a family with, you know, agricultural or viticulture background. Um, but I always worked in wine and uh, 2006, I decided to set up my own domain. Before that, I was working in different countries, um, in Spain, Australia, Italy, um, and in Germany, I worked for two um, domains in the Rheingau, which was J.B. Becker, that most of you will know. And then later, I was the technical director at the Domain Lights from Rüdesheim. Um, and, you know, coming along this, this way, I, I realized long term, I want to, to work for myself and, and realize um, the taste picture and, and, you know, the whole philosophy, everything I was looking for. And uh, which probably makes it very interesting for this class, it has always been Riesling from Slate and Quartzite. So I was always looking for Riesling grown on very mineral soils and presenting a salinity. Um, and I happened to find this in Lloyd, which is the northern part of the Rheingau region. It's who, who is familiar with the map of Germany. It's um, the Rheingau region is basically where the Rhine River goes from east to west, from Frankfurt towards Rüdesheim. And then behind the river band up north, there's Asmushausen and then Lorch. These are the two last um, villages of the Rheingau region before the Middle Rhine Valley starts. And there we are southwest facing. We have very steep slopes, some of them more than 44% of steepness. And the soil is very rocky. It's all slate, quartzite, and very mineral. And we work there since uh, 2006. Until 2011, I have been <clears throat> doing this as a part-time job. So um, to, to start to finance the whole project, I kept my full-time job at Lights for uh, five years. And then in 11, I was already at a hectare size of three hectare and, and I decided to step out of that responsibility to focus only on myself, on my own domain. And since then we have been growing to 16 hectares and we are certified organic and vegan. We play around with some biodynamic um, um, treatments and, and trials. Um, and what is very interesting, um, and we can probably talk later more about that, we see an increasing salinity and minerality in wines from land that we turn from conventional into organic farming. So every year added on farmed organic, the wines become more saline and more mineral, even from soils that are not considered very rocky from the upper Rango. But we can go more into detail later. So that's, that's a brief introduction. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Johanna? Yes, so um, hi everybody. Uh, nice to be part of this as well, or thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Johannes Weber. I'm part of the Hochul Falkenstein team, biologically part. Um, so I'm born and raised there. Um, my father was first generation, is, is, oh, you see, he's first that was. So he is first generation and I am the second. And um, yeah, we work every day, uh, kind of our asses off to um, yeah, give you give you the wine some of you hopefully need. Um, we farm about 10 hectares uh, in the area of the Saar, which is a contributory uh, uh, river to, to the Mosel. Um, small, small 800 hectare big um, area, slate driven, rocky, very, very meager soil. So as Eva mentioned to me, also a very important part to um, yeah wine quality, which is, um, very easy to drink, goes down well, light, and, and, and all the aspects we maybe discuss later. Um, vintage by vintage, um, we try to do our best and hopefully uh, 
success in that. Yeah. Um, other than that, it's 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 basically what Eva said uh, as well. It's um, just do your best, enjoy enjoy the job, and 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 later on do something special out of it or with a good with a good uh, how do you say hand hand handcraft manship just do a good product yeah that's kind of my introduction in that yeah and later on the details with whole bunch pressing and wood cask and all of that and we we go step by step i think otherwise it gets too long if i start talking it gets too long <laughs> <laughs> excellent thank you johannes mm -hmm. um well i guess the place to start is the vast majority of racing produced in Germany, you know, at the most recent vintage is dry, 70% or so. But the myth in export markets persists that German Riesling is sweet. Where does that come from and what has changed um, to, to break that myth? So it's my question, yeah? Sure, you can start. <laughs> my question, Eva. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no uh, I mean, it's, it's, let's say I'm, it's a difficult topic because most of the time, obviously you are, self-centered is the wrong word, but you're working with your winery and have just your um, point of view. Um, I would say a lot of, of the um, image of German Riesling in the later, of the earlier history is basically after the war, uh, sterile filter soup and everything was established white yeast wasn't the topic so you fermented you produced your wine and you wanted to make cash as fast as possible and not for the small wineries but basically for the uh, cooperatives and the big bulk producers and uh, with that came later on if you can correct me if, if i'm wrong but to me it just came with uh, the brown milch with stuff sweet sweet wine from it didn't matter which region kind of it was riesling sweet riesling was the variety everybody knew nobody knew uh, would have known in the sweet scheurebe or sweet uh, Müller toga it didn't matter it was basically the riesling because it was the wine or the grape with with um, uh, heritage from the heydays uh, 50 years ago uh, back then and um so basically i would say that perception is coming from a lot of of cheap uh, easy to access wine in big quantities that destroyed or even didn't allow something special to start and then you had wine laws or wine law in 71 which also allowed sites to grow in immense uh, scales so in our area a size from a site from five hectare went up to 50 hectare just to please more or less the needs of big production and not the now uh, every block is special uh, blah 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 we are doing um, it was everything was contributed to uh, produce and produce and easy sell and cheap and you know turn 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 the quantities yeah that's kind of how, how i see why there is a mis misunderstanding coming up because german wine wasn't sweet always wasn't always sweet i mean also in the heydays it was more or less it was before sterile filter it was more or less it's, sweeter wines were 15 20 30 gram otherwise they would have fermented again they were wrecked if they were very noble they were, were wrecked over the years and not bottled straight away other wine was tr but drunk it very fast um, so that's what i know i think that's a kind of the and it's you know you know how it is with image if it if once it's established it's hard to get it away in in, in all of the ways or it's destroyed very fast such as the glycol scandal then in the 80s okay it all came together with with German reasoning somehow. So for you, it really starts with the post-war period. That, that identity of Sweden. Yeah, you want to demand, people want to build up their country, or let's say Germany, you know, everything was at the bottom and not everybody nowadays, you know, you go to your shipper, you have your paper maker, you have your, all, every, every estate has kind of how, how they do the export or the, let's say the worldwide, most of the estate who do export know what they're doing so in the, the small and quality estate so in, in that time i think they just produced grapes so to the guy was the highest bidding was very easy especially in our area mosul in our area was very easy to sell to the you know the the, the upper class wineries or at least even the cheap bulk stuff and uh, you just produced something and they made the wine and the image and not you yeah. that's what i would say yeah but i even I, just Eva, what do you what do you think? I mean, Rango has also other other stories. Um, 
I I agree on the um, the the big part of the 70s and the big share in destroying the reputation of German wine and and creating a cheap imprint of sweet wine. But I would say um, the that there has been an amazing and and very important history in in high class noble sweet wines, Spätlese, Auslese. Um, if you read old old wine books and wine menus, um, there has been Auslese, Spätlese from uh, the Mosel, but uh, from Rheingau, and they these wines they have been more expensive than Bordeaux, Burgundy, and uh, Champagne, and it's it's crazy. Like sometimes three times the price in the most exclusive wine menus. So there has been uh, a time where there was a very high reputation and there was um, um, a high value of noble sweet wines from Germany. And probably in those days, it was the only variety where you could make in combination with, like Johannes said, there has been then filtration and there has been tons of sulfur. <laughs> People love the sulfur. So there had been methods to actually create this wine. Um, and and bottle it and preserve the sweetness um, and German wine has been famous for that in certain times. I totally agree with you, Hannes. There have been times where before that, where wines fermented dry, they were stored in cast, they were made over a year. So there have been lots of, lots of oxidation, second fermentation, things like that. But I think there has been minimum since around 1900. 1920, like a, a very high class handcrafted noble sweet wine tradition. And for this, Germany was famous. And I think what happened then, what happened then was um, that in the 70s with the no, not new wine law, but and then also the whole story of Le Frauenmilch, um, there has been created this image of the, the nice sweet wine for everyone. And if you read this story of Le Frauenmilch, this actually had been, has been a very, very high value brand. This was like a top grand cru. And, and it has been, and it actually is still today. I have been visiting it half a year ago. It's one of the most outrageous terroirs I've seen in Germany. And I've been talking to, to the owners and I've been reading a bit. Le Frauenmilch has not necessarily been the cheap thing. It comes from something very extra, extraordinary and high class, but it was then commercialized in the 70s. And then that what Johannes said happened. And it has been, you know, like the big export thing. It has been about big volumes, but not only the Le Frauenmilch, there would in general, the wine production was in a, coming to a different point. People were paid by liter from hectare. So what happened also in Geisenheim, they developed new clones. Um, the new clones had a higher, had a better ratio from uh, more flesh, thinner skins, more juiciness. Um, plants were, um, there, there were modern breedings that were creating more liter, uh, more, more yield. So everything was, taken into a very commercial industrial way, like Johanna said, and these were probably, it, they were the years after war, the, you know, the start into a big economy, the unlimited growth, the opening of new markets, um, becoming famous for a, a certain product. And um, I think it's a whole system. And then, you know, you have the new grapes, you have the the um, developing agricultural techniques, the start of herbicide use and, and fertilizers in the 70s. So it, it has not only been about the economy breaking up and, and, and markets craving more wine and, and producers seeing the chance to, to sell huge amounts. It has also been a time um, where, where people started started into industrialization in every aspect of life, in food, in wine, in agriculture, in probably every other industry as well. So these came together 
and they created wines suddenly you know the density got lost they people started that what was originally a handcrafted product said suddenly was an industrialized product and and it started becoming replaceable and and like in modern food i mean you know items start products start being a super handcrafted high quality product and then it's successful and it it's supposed to be commercialized and then you try to find cheaper ingredients and you try to su su place um, flavors. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking of Nutella right now, <laughs> you know, have less hazelnuts, have more flavor. And, and it happened in so many aspects in other industries as well. And I think that is what happened. And then came the wine scandal and all the things added up. They just, and it was a long time. And, and what was left in people's minds was cheap, shitty with you know manipulated product um thin then in years where that weren't so warm like now probably acidic you know one came to the other and the the glorious image just faded there was also wasn't there a bit of the immediacy was one of the things that i think changed because the the menus that you're talking about the the heyday of these sweet wines, they weren't being drunk in the vintage that they were being made, correct? They no, were exactly. They were stored, and there was yeah, exactly. There was um, a, a, a different um, time aspect in it taking time to grow it, taking time to produce it, and taking time to sell it. And that's what seems to be returning more and more, which is really wonderful to see. Is that. Yeah winemakers are holding on to their wines. They're asking people to, to wait. So what role for you, Eva, does sweetness play when you're looking at your vineyards? Not necessarily sugar levels, but what are, what are you looking for? What are you thinking about when you go to your different vineyards, when you're trying to create a style of wine? Does sugar play a role? Does it not? And just it's talk a little bit. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And, and it's also true the way you, you ask or say it. Um, there are certain vineyards I would always make sweet or off dry. And then there are certain vineyards, for example, Krone. We have gray slate on chalk. We have higher pH. It's a very rich, very, it's also mineral. It's saline, but the pH is higher. The acidity is naturally low. There are things coming together. If I would make this wine sweet, it would be fat and, and you know it would lose um, it would lose focus. It would be saturating. It would be too much. Fermented dry. This actually creates a very very elegant textured style of wine, warm, rich, richer in alcohol, but very dry, minerally, minerally dry in finish. And and if I ferment it dry, it shows. If I take then another side, for example, the Seligmacher that is purely gray slate with quartzite. It's very high also in altitude. It's steep and it has a very high percentage of quartzite. And these makes, these are three facts that when they come together, they create a, a strong salinity. Wines can really taste nearly salty. And if you then have sugar, the sugar, it shows in a more fruit complex, mm -hmm. complexity, but it does not seem sweet. So it, in years, especially um, that have less sun and we probably have a bit more acidity, it happens to me very often that people come back and say, you ha your label is wrong. There's the word truck and missing, but we actually do have 12, 13, 16 gram per liter of sugar. So like in cooking, you, you know, when, when you cook, you always, have, you always have salt, sugar, and acidity, and it's a triangle. And if your, you know, if your dish becomes too salty, you add sugar and you add acidity. Or if it's too sour, you know, you always use the parameters to balance. And I think wines growing on this mineral slide, slate or soil, they offer this amazing chance of this taste triangle, salt, acidity, sugar. If we have wines from more um, vigorous, 
soil, flat land, high nitrogen, clay, loam, the salt is missing. And it's all about acidity and sugar. So for example, in, we also make some wines in the upper rank of, we have uh, land in, in Hiedrich, but also in Elfville, we make um, this wine, the Melange, it's a, it's a blend from the upper rank up. Um, and it's basically very rich soil. So they're strange. In these soils, it's fruit, it's juiciness, it's texture. They have a different quality to shine. And if I have 10 grams of sugar in these wines, these wines seem sweet. If I have 10 grams in Seligmacher, that is purely slate and quartzite, the wine still seems dry. Okay. The analysis, 10 gram per liter of residual sugar, can have, dependent on the soil and the vineyard, can it be absolutely tasting dry or already off dry sweet. Yeah, okay, so sugar can enhance the natural aspects of and the wine. Exactly, and to me it's very important to, to look, to, to check the vineyard first and see the quality of the land, see the exposition, acidity, it's very important when it comes to sugar, so altitude, or maybe the, um, how do you say, the expo exposition to the sun, south, southwest, in large weird southwest, west facing sometimes even. Wow. So it's a lot cooler, like the final parts, they're very cool actually, the, the sun, the moment the sun goes around the corner, the temperatures are dropping. Mm -hmm. While at the same time of the day, in Kiedrich or Elderville, 100% south facing, the sun is still there. <laughs> so that creates a different level of acidity. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. How about you, Johannes? Uh, the question was late and... Uh, <laughs> no. The, the so, question was, what, what role does sugar yeah, play? I just, I just, got, you know, just got into the Rango Geisenheim time back then. No, 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 you, you have to stay in the czar. I'm sorry, you, you each have your area. <laughs> I mean, Science and sugar or wine and sugar is very nice to play when you have Riesling as grape, first of all. And then, like if I said, you can play more or less with the components, obviously, of the soil, whether it is richer, deeper, or top layer, rocky underneath, or whatever. But it's always nice to have that rocky. And in our area, and Riesling is connected to that as well, is the slate very important? So for us, it's more or less you have the slate and you have more slate, less slate, more top layer, more water supply here and there. Microclimate changes a bit, but it's, it's basically you play with that. So we have uh, on, on, on the one side um, an amount of acidity due to the vintage and on the other side you have that sugar level and the, yeah, the, the, the challenge is it to, to find out which side fits which wine later on, uh, how does the side ferment, do you need to force it down, do you need to, is it, is it going by nature, what we really like to have obviously, or what every good winemaker should like to have is that you don't need to force something to, uh, to some uh, finer style or sweet style or trucking style, so it should do it by its own. I mean, sometimes, you know, rea reality is a bit different, but most of the time it should go where you want it to go, and that has a lot of to do how you harvest, when do you pick and how is the vintage in, in, in nutrition rates and all of that details. But the, the, the fun part about perception or what you say, the, 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 why is it so difficult to understand German reasoning with sweetness, there's also a fun part. And, and also when you look at the good times 100 years ago, there is hard to make a wine in the world with such an elegance, with such an, but such a structure in, 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 in such a going down well way as a Riesling is. And then you have obviously Rheinhessen, Rheingau, Mosel, Salz, whatever, and you can find your style. But other than that, it's very nice to play with that. And the sugar is a part of that. But to me, it's just a part of uh, a big matrix of, of, of things where you better accept it's a matrix you would never understand and you feel more or less your guts. And then you make a wine that hopefully suits you and then you go out there and say like a chicken that gawks when it lays an egg look it's me it's a good wine look 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 and then you have a hopefully somebody who finds that as well and uh, you sell a few bottles and then that's how you start i think later on um, people people come back to you and say how great it was and you get more motivation and to me sugar is just 
you can talk about pH and acidity and all of that. It's it's some some amounts to or it's 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 just something you hold on to because most of the time it's hard to understand everything and it feels so well if you buy a bottle of wine and you have like 10.4 gram per liter acidity and 15 gram per liter sugar and you know it's it's but it's just 0.1 percent of the story to me. Yeah. So it's not about numbers; it's about the perception. It's about what. Yeah. In my in my point of view, I sometimes get a bit tired if you know somebody uh, retail store somewhere ask about the residual sugar and alcohol and uh, sweetness levels, and I think you know yeah okay, <laughs> but it's it's that's just so such a little amount of the whole wine and, and you know but it helps sometimes obviously to sell. But how do you convince them then? That's that's one of the things that I think oh, yeah, we're, we're really interested in is is how do you get people away from the numbers. I mean, on the one hand, it seems that, that Germany is, is mm. all about numbers and, and, mm. and facts and figures and laws, but the wines are, at least the best of the wines are for me, the polar opposite of that. They're not about numbers. They're about perception, like you just said. How do you, tr how do you convince somebody? Well, I mean, there's, it's, um, uh, you know, if, if somebody, I'm not saying that if, if you need the numbers, that's a bad thing, but to me, it's just such, such a small amount of the whole story. But obviously, if somebody's really into that, or it's like somebody likes sweet wine and you want to convince them about trucking, like we talk now, it's just, you know, you just, I think a calm and happy pouring wines and having a nice tasting and just a good surrounding uh, skips that back. But if you are just on the shelf and you know you have the numbers, then they help. But if, how we get away from that is with the few customers we have, and just personal tastings, seller tastings, give them a personal idea of ourselves and not just about if it's green or blue slate or red slate. So it's more about also the percentage of the human being behind of it. And, yeah, that's how we try to get away from it. Make it a, a story without plan to make it a story, but just be, just go and out there and pour your wine or try it, find people. And hopefully it reverberates in other directions and or it um, is a self, is a self propelling machine. I, just something that just starts itself somehow. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, it is nothing what you better don't start when, when it's, um, when you're not sure about this, about what you're doing, uh, if you think like that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. It's a very important point, I think, and that's one that's just so often lost in the conversation is that sweetness, fruit, it's just one element of many, and you think mm -hmm. that it's part of the triangle, and Johannes, you said, it's part of a huge complex a matrix that we can't even really begin to understand, and I think that's not so hard for people to understand. I don't know why that message doesn't come across more clearly, but it seems like it does in Germany, perhaps because there's a cultural context for it, um, or because the market has watched the evolution of the wines and can understand the nuances a little better. What do you think, um, Eva? Yeah, um, I I think yeah that there's a there is also a historical understanding which comes from the predicate system. Um, and and the system itself is actually a, a great measurement and system. Um, however, how how do I deal with it? Um, I have stepped away from using the predicat, except if we really have really sweet wines, like we are with sugar over 60, 70 gram per liter, then I would use Spätleser Auslese. But apart from that, I degrade everything to QBA since over 10 years now. And I put the focus also with the label on the site. Um, so I have a regional blend, I have different village blends, and then I have single sites. And I just make these wines. I don't make this and that and dum -dum 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 and, and another Spätlese. And you know, there's I I try to keep it simple and I try to follow maybe it's a more Burgundian understanding or also in Italy, in, 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 in Spain, a classification that goes by land, by terroir and by the site that, you know, comes from regional and then it builds up to the top single site. Um, and I, I do it the same as Johannes when we taste wine, I hardly hand out analysis. 
I do if people need to have it. But if you know we have imported tasting or journalist tasting and we have it at home or or even in, in a restaurant or somewhere in, in a different place or I'm invited somewhere, I ask people to taste first. I say I, I'm happy to tell you whatever anal analysis you want to have, but I will do it later and I want you to taste first. And I think that is very important because um, if it, it's, it happens very often the other way around that you say, this is hot um, trocken uh, or off dry and people say, oh no, I don't like sweet wine. They taste the same wine blind later and they say, wow, this is amazing. This is the wine I love. This is what I actually really like. And you say, okay, but this is, you know, it's not dry. And, and so it's very important to create the atmosphere and the tasting to tell your philosophy, to tell the story and to tell the characteristics of a year. The vintage is super important in this whole salt, sugar, acidity um, thing. And, and maybe, it's, maybe you can put it, put it down as building a matter of trust between you and, and the one you present your wine to that he is willing to, you know, to listen and to actually let the taste um, describe it and, and, you know, feel the wine. And then later you can look at numbers and everything. Great point. So Johannes, can you maybe pick up on that and just talk a little bit about your approach? I mean, your labeling is hyper-specific with the predicates. You've remained very loyal to that. What do you feel that that helps people understand about your wines? Why is that an advantage for you? Uh, wow. um, we actually, the, the, my dad just did it and somehow uh, it stayed. And then we got both numbers and now we have Uncle Peter on it or Google Peter and it got even more crazy and it's just crazy. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, my dad is a child of glycol scanners. That's to be start with, and um, at that time, you know, with the with the thinking of just sweet, cheap, and everybody, you know, you know they did all the stuff, uh, glycerol in the wine, sugar in the wine, to just uh, made out of a QBA ish bad laser with just sell it higher price, the bulk wine, just they cheated everywhere. So he came out and started with the wine that had a predicate on, and just bone dry. Just the predicate, you weren't allowed to chapterize, and he just did bone dry to show the people of these trust in me. And it was hard times the first 10, 20 years. And um, basically, we stuck to that. And we found out that there is a niche for us, uh, such as a cabinet trocken, spätle the fine herbs. Um, it's basically. Uh, if I could, you know, do a wine and people would straight away know that Google Peter is this and that, it would be way easier. But sometimes people maybe need a bit of help. Um, I understand Eva's way or I see this is way, way more uh, common nowadays. I mean, we, there's hardly, there's some cabinet trocken, but the Spätlis Fine Lab is in the most, is like a, also a goods wine. So, most of the, let's say it is not with the predicate. And um, for us, it just worked very well. And the acidity sugar balance, you could match with such a wine is very nice for us. I mean, it just, it just fits us and we didn't, didn't see a need to change. Um, and then obviously we have a, um, a friend called Lars Carbeck and he's also super geeky. So he forced us then a bit, or not forced us, but you know, oh, Google Peter and some customers said it was very nice. Yeah, put Palm on, put Uncle Peter on. And this year we went all the way and uh, some, but you know, there's also a downside. Sometimes people know better about your blocks and, and barrels than you at that moment and say, why, why does he not know so much? That, 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 that should be a secret there. <laughs> no, but it's, it's we just we just keep on doing what we do. It, some, the, the label looks like a, a good a good uh, uh, newspaper site. I mean, it's black and white. It's just written down those crazy names in the Manning Herrenberg, All the pronunciation issues for English speaking. Yeah, yeah, there's a label here. Yeah. English speaking um, people, uh, but you know, we, it just works and it works for us. It helps us. We have those five six sites, and obviously we I could go in detail, but we love all of the vineyards. Some are need a bit more treatment, some don't, some are oh, everybody's darling, some are just ours, and we ask why don't the people see the potential. But other than that, 
we have our friends and customers who basically buy the wines and we try to push them in other cars because everybody goes crazy about that car and then about that car. But we have to push them a bit that we can say we sell the wine. Otherwise, everybody would buy in a cabinet, cabinet nowadays. And um, yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. But uh, I, we just do the predicate system and we just stick to it. And no need at the moment to change. Yeah. Um. Thinking, thinking about Predicat um, brings me sort of to a, one of my favorite topics, which is fine ham, mm -hmm. which is the polar opposite of Predicat. Um, mm -hmm. Eva, in your portfolio, you have, I believe, four different off dry. Is that what you're calling fine ham? Well, f first of all, the word fine ham has no definition by law. And um, I think very in the beginning, I think 13. I once made Rango or Lodge off dry. Uh, I didn't use fine hair, I always called it off dry um, because I found it disturbing. There's some people who use fine hair for 25 grams and others use it for three grams or for six grams. And, um, and the word itself, as other words in German language, is you know, it's not very sexy. Fine hair, it's you know, it's the. Uh, <laughs> What does it mean? And, and then if it also lacks definition and there is a certain dilution in the market, I have decided to not use it. So I, you can say, I just don't use anything. So I have trucking or I have nothing. Now you can say, I leave my consumer, uh, un, um, you know, un, uh, how do you say, educated or, or I leave them wondering. But I think that is also part on trusting the vineyard. And, and trusting the wine and the blend. And I just, you know, I want to be seen for my wines. If, you know, if I manage to create a taste picture of a site over many vintages, I think that is, that would describe what I personally would like to do with my work. And let's take Schlossberg, it's like my, dry, my off dry Grand Cru. Mm -hmm. And in some years it's 26 and others it's 16. So I don't want to be put down to a number. Again, it is, again, what Johanna said earlier, it has to do with the year. It has to do with the acidity, with the minerality. Um, you can have a great acidity or sugar, but maybe it's a very dry year. So you lack a little bit of, you know, soil solution and mineral component. And, and then your sweetness seems a lot sweeter. So uh, then I would ferment further. Right. I, I, so that's, that's the, um, yeah, I, I probably try not to be bound to something and, and just put the vineyard in front. I think that's what I would like to do. Okay. So you're looking to set up a system of trust with the, with the people, with your, with your consumers. That but, they'll follow a vineyard and follow a style and, uh, and understand what they're getting from that. Exactly. Okay. Understand the site also. Understand that Schlossberg it, in our portfolio is always off dry, but no matter how off dry it is, that will be in the context of vintage and it doesn't matter. It's about meeting the balance and, and you know, fermenting one of these wines dry would make them alcoholic and hard. Um, mm -hmm. Like what I can do in Corona, I cannot do in Schlossberg and, and it's more that I would like to create an understanding of the site and the soil rather than the, yeah, the chemical parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Ava, just continue with you for a moment. You said that when you started your estate in 2006, that people laughed at your ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of those ideas and how did they tie into dry versus sweet? It, say that again. How how was how do they tie into the topic we're discussing? Was that part of was style part of those ideas that were part no, of? It? No, it, I think it was more the fact itself. I want to create my my own winery, my own wine. Then I went to Lorch. At that time, Lorch was really not known, and and um, and. Actually, many producers said to me, why did you go to Lorch? Everyone knows Lorch is complicated and there's the Lorch Atone and there's this and that. Why don't you go to Upper Rheingau? Take the, you know, the different land. So um, 
I I saw vineyards and I immediately fell in love with it, with the whole microclimate, the whole the whole valley and everything. Um, but I think it just historically have, even though it historically is one of the important parts in Rheingau horticulture, it has never seen the fame that has uh, like Rudisheim or Schloss Johannesberg or or Kiedrich. Um, so I think the that people laughed a bit about what I was doing or, or laughing is maybe said too much, but they didn't take it serious. They said, let her go, let her try, you know. I think um, that also came from the fact that no one really paid attention to Lorch. And, um, and coming back to the Predicat system, in when I started, I used Predicat system and every year, you know, you have to put your wines into this blind tasting food to get the AP number to be allowed to sell it. So in the first years I did that and um, every time, so it's supposed to be a blind tasting, supposed to be, um, and neutral, and then wines are lined up and if you have an Auslese, it's put in line with other Auslese or other wines of that category. So it always happened that the wines from Lorsch, because it was actually more middle Rhine, even though it's Appalachian Rhine, but, but the geology, the, um, the whole perception of salt salinity of lightness was middle Rhine. So an Auslese from Lorsch, standing next to an Auslese from Kiedrich, it always came back to, it's not enough, it's not good enough, it's not fulfilling the predicate, you have to degrade, you have to degrade, you have to degrade. So that, and you know, that's first of all, it was frustrating. Um, but then it also said to me, okay, this cannot be my future. And if that is putting wines in numbers, then I don't want to do it. Then I, I want to put wine into the vineyard, the site, the microclimate, everything that is natural. And so that actually was my start. And all these things came together and yeah, maybe people did not take it serious. And I did not take it that serious. When, when I started, it was a hobby. I didn't know I would be sitting here today with 16 hectares. You know, I, I was, I, it was a naive start. I wanted to make my own wine. It should be from Slate and it should be Riesling, just a bit. And I played around in a garage so that, you know, it's, um, it was a different time. <laughs> Johannes, um, just thinking in terms of, of balance, the czar has, uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier um, before we opened up, the czar has sort of undergone a bit of a revival um, in recent years and what was czar wine 20, 30 years ago has changed significantly. And you had mentioned that it's sort of reflecting your style has stayed consistent, but it's become much more in the in the mainstream acceptance. Can you talk a little bit about what changes you've seen with climate and has that affected your style? Where do you think things are going to be going? Um, just talking a little bit about Czar um, and the style of it would be great. Yeah, uh, I would say the potential of the Czar was and is always there. Um, it is a, a question of the uh, winter to do so, to, 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 to get it out of the ground, to really make, it, make, make the effort for, for it. Um, I mean, uh, how, the Tsar is, is a bit higher up. The Tsar is a bit more open to winds. The Tsar is, you know, the, the rolling hills, the, the woods are nearby. It is everything but warm, most of all. I mean, it is still cooler than the others. It is still, yeah, just just that tiny bit. And if I talk about others, uh, I also mean the most. I mean, Ruva Ruva is quite similar, but other terroir a bit, uh, bit differs a bit. But there is that that crazy good potential for nowadays. I use the word again, zeitgeist, to to fit in that in that light and elegant and, and full of finesse spot. You 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 can do uh, brisk, sappy, elegant wines that that really go down well. And uh, in terms of uh, climate change, 
you are able to do so every year by year. And if you, I'm not, I'm not saying like when we had the chat before, I'm not saying that the Tsar didn't have great vintages before, but just the year by year um, is, is new the last 30 years now. And uh, it's definitely uh, the climate change. Other than that, you have crazy good estates um, popping up and a high density of people with money that has nothing to do with selling wine. So if you have 800 hectares and you have like a, 10 out of 20 good estates who are who made or still make make their money in other ways and you know use that to finance their dream um, it lifts also us up uh, it is, it is um, it's, it's an help for everybody there's obviously sometimes when you talk about um, taking serious to be taken seriously um, for them it's, it's difficult too but also the other way around you know they want to play straight in the first league um, so it's a it's a competition but it's also beneficial for everybody. And like I said, you have the Scharzhofberg, you have Ochsener Bockstein, you have great sites everywhere. And then you have such sites that are forgotten, like the Scharzberg of ours or Barbara Goldberg, who was, uh, or Geisberg now, what all, all what uh, Van Volksen um, mm -hmm. restored again. You know, that's, that's really in that density. Uh, you imagine the Falls would have to have uh, hundreds of those guys, 200 of those guys by hectare or more to have this feeling of every village has a new upcoming or a new uh, old estate uh, re renewed and established again after bankruptcy or whatever. So all that comes together and it's, you know, it's a bit, um, also what, what I like about the area you're close to Luxembourg, it's more this triangle, France is not far away, it's a bit, it's, you know, it's, I think it's an open area. Um, it's a, I mean, it's sometimes closed in the village as in every village, but it's, it's a very nice area and it's perfect to, to make this long lasting, aging, nice wines. And when, when, you, when you really want to do it and not just go for the bigger is better, then mm -hmm. I think um, you're good to go in the zone. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Eva, you're, you're, what I've always loved about Losch is that you have, you're really on, and you alluded to this earlier, you're on the bridge between the Middle Rhine and the Rheingau, two very different, um, two very different regions. And yet you're there where you, in Losch, which is, which is Rheingau. Do you consider yourself more of a Rheingau winemaker or more of a Middle Rhine or more of a bridge between the two? Mm. I consider myself being a Rango winemaker um, because I, I probably my name was made with Lars or in Lars and that was for a long time um, my, my focus and, and the only land I had. But in the past I have also been growing and, and exploring the amazing terroir in the upper Rango. So and we, we started with single vineyards in, in um, Kiedrich then uh, we had some in Hattenheim and then lately in, in Eltville and, and the last one that um, where we grew was actually, um, it, it's a beautiful piece. It's the last two hectare of the old famous domain Schloss Elz. So wow. it is in Eltville. It's, it was not a, affected by Flurbereinigung. It's from the 60s. And so we have old vines um, and it's brand new. So we have harvested it the first time in, in 19. And since it came from conventional farming, from a, a big production that I think overcropped the whole thing and it was in very bad shape, um, we, we will have that year and probably this year to change it. And it will be like Village or Ranga Riesling. But I can see already from the first grapes, from the con conversion year, the greatness of this terroir and the expression and the, also for sure the old vines, but there's also something about the soil where I can refer to the historical fame of especially Rhino. You know, Rhino reasons they were worldwide famous. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, Many years people said, what happened? What, what is there? I, I say it has always been there. It's a matter of industrialized farming or lower crop, the way you farm. Mm -hmm. and, 
and then it reveals itself. And in that sense, I'm intrigued by that as much and, and by what we have from in Kiedrich in terms of vineyards as much as Lorch. Lorch sure always stays the precious one and you know it's it's the start of the domain so it has an emotional um uh, value to me and it's super specific and certainly that is all middle rhine it has nothing to do with rheingau we can clearly say that but if you ask me am i what producer am i <laughs> i think I'm, I'm i'm both and and i value both areas for what they are and it's great fun in both sides to make wine they are different the challenge is different the winemaking is different the growing is different everything is different but everything on its own is a beautiful project okay and i'm very grateful to have the chance to make both of them yeah um, i'm sorry to say that it's uh three pages of questions but we've run out of time so um you're your answers and conversation were really wonderful. If anybody wants to throw a question or a comment in chat or just unmute themselves and ask Ava or Johannes, please feel free, but we are right at one hour, so we've gone a bit over. Um, I Do people feel like there's a clear understanding of why the myth of German sweetness has persisted for the so long? Are we all ready to go out there and debunk it? <laughs> I hope so. Um, the only thing I did want to say before we went any further, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning, was I wanted to give a big thank you for our new website um, and our logo design, which was done by the amazing team at Meeting Again, which is a uh, a PR company here in Germany um, in Bad Durkheim and they have worked well over time many late nights to put this uh, help us all put this together so before I forgot I wanted to make sure and say a thank you yeah and um, we will since we don't have any questions right now um, we hope that we can welcome you back on Thursday at the same time We'll have episode two and the topic is really tackling things head on. What is the grudge against German wine? Um, and our guests will be two people who are really well qualified to discuss. One is New York Times wine critic Eric Asimov and the second guest is Anna Krivel, Master of Wine based in the UK. So we hope you'll join us and get their perspective and feel free to add yours and thank you again very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Johannes, and thank you, Eva, and thank you to everybody who came in. Thank you.